All right. Well, I think it's time, so I will uh, begin with a word of prayer. So, uh, dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this morning. Um, and we thank you for all your many blessings to us. I just pray that you'd uh, guide our steps today, help us to uh, understand the math we're going over, and I just pray that you'd just uh, encourage each one, each one of these students as they work on this class. Lord, do, your, do their best each day, Lord, for your glory. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, so um, let me get straight into it. I have examples to show you guys. Um, so here's example one. Um, you have a train. Um, goes 120 miles per hour for 12 minutes. What's the distance traveled? So the first couple problems I'm going to work with you guys today are just applications um, applications of linear equations. So I think technically this is section 1.2. The first four problems in your homework too are this, this sort of thing, all right? So the key here is to understand what's the, you know, what's the relation we're working with. A couple different ways to look at it. Um, velocity is distance over time, right? So here we're given the velocity or the speed, right? Um, and we know the time. We want the distance. So we solve for d. d equals vt. Got to be careful with the units here. We have 120 miles per hour, which is miles over hour, right? And then the time is 12 minutes, right? How do you convert minutes to hours? How about this? We do one hour over 60 minutes. That's the conversion factor, right? And that gives me what? 12 over 60 minutes. Let me see me hours, which is what? Well, I'll just write it that way. Um, I mean, you could simplify that, I suppose, but look at 0 0.2. But I'll, I'll just leave it at 12 over 60 because that serves my purposes here. I won't even have to get out my calculator, right? Um, because 120 over 60 is what? It's, uh, it's 2. 2 times 12 is 24, right? So you've got 24 miles. Right? So if you think like I do, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you're going 120 miles per hour, that means like every 6 minutes you're going 12 miles, right? So if you go, you know, 12 minutes, you're going... 24 miles. Anyway, there it is. Example two. Any questions? No. Okay. Example two. We have $970 invested at 11% yearly, right? All right. And then the question is, how much interest earned after one year? So I think this problem, this problem's not too hard. What's the formula here that, how do we calculate simple interest? Do you guys remember? So the formula is I equals PRT. Very good. PRT. So here the principal is, you know, $970. The rate is 11% yearly. What do we put there? Do we put 11? I mean, I wish, right? What do you do? Point, yeah, 0 0.11, right? We got to put it in, that, in those sorts of terms. And then the time, well, the time is, is one, right? So if instead of a year, you had like a half a year, you'd put 0.5 here, right? But since we have one year, we just put one, which means we don't really have to do anything, but I'll put it there for the, for the sake of discussion. So 970 times 
And um, what's that give us? So I get 106.7. So we say $106 and 70 cents. Now, <laughs> good luck finding a bank or something that will give you 11% simple interest <laughs> on your investment, right? I mean, it's easy to lose this percentage per year, right? It's pretty simple at the moment. You just take money out of your pocket, put it in front of you, leave it on a table in your apartment, just like that come back to it in a year, it's lost 11% of its value because we've got about 11% inflation right now. But it's hard to do this. Like, it's hard to earn money on money, right? Um, funny thing, you know. Any questions? So, like, if you, hypothetical, if you somehow had a credit card which charged simple interest, they don't. But if you did, imagine, you spent $970 start of the year, right? You come back to that money that you spent a year later, Ignoring all of the other draconian things credit cards do to you, like, you know, late fees, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, if they were just charging you simple interest, you would owe the credit card company $970 plus $106.70 at the end of the year, right? In practice, you owe them a lot more because every time you don't pay the minimum pay payment, they dock you like 30 bucks or something, which is actually way, way more than interest. So, but anyway. All right, enough about that. Example three, here we have rectangle and we're told that the width is 44 centimeters. We're told the length, well we're not told the length, we don't know what that is. We're told the perimeter is 180 centimeters. Then the question is, what's the length? All right, so I'm writing the problem statement in blue. I'm going to write the solution in red, all right, just so you know. So how would we, how would you go about solving this? What's the, well, the for one of the first things to do is to give a name to the thing you don't know. I've already done that, right? I've said the length is L. We don't know L. But we also know it's a rectangle, right? So there's L here, there's L over here, and there's also W up here. What's the perimeter? The perimeter is L plus L plus W plus W. In other words, it's 2L plus 2W, right? It's the sum of the lengths around the edge of the rectangle. This is the perimeter. What are we trying to, we're trying to find L, right? So solve for L. L is equal to what? 180 centimeters minus 2 times 44 centimeters and then I have to divide by 2. So I just took the equation above and I solved for L and I put in the number that we're given for, for W. And then what happens? We got, here it is. If you work it out, 180 minus 88 is 92. 92 divided by 4 is 46. So the answer here is 46 centimeters. Which some of you might have been able to guess in middle school without like any kind of algebra. Yeah? Divided by four divided by two. Divided by two. So all I'm doing is I'm taking this equation right here, right? Uh, I thought you, sorry, I thought you said four. Oh, oh, no, no, two, two. I might have said four, but that was a, uh, I just misspoke. Yeah. Okay, so that's it. That's it for uh, section 1.2. I will now move on talk to you guys about complex numbers. So complex numbers have the form C equals A plus IB such that A and B are real numbers and I is the square root of minus one. Right? So what, what, is, what can you tell me about I squared? What's I squared equal to? 
It's all good. Um, I, I, one. I squared is one. Uh, no, no, no. I squared. Square to minus one squared. What would that be? I mean, this is the funny thing. Is it, it's minus one, right? So this is very unusual, right? You can't take a real number and square it and get a negative number, can you? No. no. So this is really something foreign to our usual experience. This imaginary unit, right? So it's I squared is equal to negative one, right? So let's, um, you know, let's look at some consequences of that. Example four, what happens if you calculate like i to the fourth power? What's that look like? Well, that would be i squared times i squared, right? Which would be minus one times minus one. What's minus one times minus one? Not a trick question. <laughs> yeah, just, just one, right? So yeah, i to the fourth power is one. But, you know, it's, you can play this game more, right? You can say like, i to the 12th power. What's i to the 12th power? It's i to the 4th power cubed, yeah? What is i to the 4th power cubed? Well, that's 1 cubed, which is, again, 1. Let's see here. Let me look at one that's not 1. How about this? What if we had i to the 13th power? How would that work? That's i times i to the 12th power, which is what? i times 1, which by the way is, is i. All right, what else could happen? What if you had i cubed? What would that look like? So there you've got i squared, i times i squared, right? Which is i times minus 1. In other words, you get minus i. Yep. Can you I'm calculating powers of i. All I'm doing is just using that i, I squared is minus 1. So, you know, you have some homework problems that ask you to calculate like i to the ninth power or something. I'm trying to show you like what you need to know to do those, which is pretty much just that i to the fourth is 1. So you can use the regular laws of exponents. You know, if you have like i to the a times i to the b, you have i to the a plus b. And um, also we have like, you know, this is the usual law of exponents here also, right? Yeah? Um, kind of expanding on that question, I know, like, I know you mentioned the formula, like, formula, i to the fourth is equal to one. So like, is there anything we can think about, like, if it's i to an even number, does it equate to, you know, i times an integer? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it cycles. So the way it goes is it goes like 1, i, i squared is minus 1, i cubed is minus i, i to the fourth is 1, i to the fifth is i. So it always goes through the cycle of 1, uh, it always goes through the cycle of like i minus 1 minus i, 1 again. So there's only four things it can take on, either plus or minus 1 or plus or minus i, and it just cycles through those over and over and over again. But Anyway, um, there's something else interesting here, um, and this doesn't really come up anywhere else in the course, but just, just to mention it. Um, so if we have i squared is minus 1, we can rewrite that as minus i squared is equal to 1, right? Multiplying that equation by minus 1. Or just to, to make it a little bit more clear, I could rewrite that as minus i times i equals to 1, okay? I'm not really said anything terribly profound here. Then do what? I could, I could divide by i, right? What would that show us? Exactly, negative i is equal to 1 over i. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of weird, right? <laughs> um, so this imaginary number i is something that is foreign to our experience with just regular real arithmetic, right? Now, I think the term imaginary is unfortunate because they're really not imaginary in the sense of like, you know, I don't know, a balanced budget for the federal government or something, but um, I mean, they're, they're real in the sense of real numbers, just as real in terms of their existence, 
Um, imaginary numbers could be used to explain all kinds of things. For example, well, I, okay, so um, a little bit more terminology here. Um, ah. uh, let's see, let me multiply a couple of them here for you. 2 plus 3i times 7 uh, minus 4i, all right? How do you multiply complex numbers? The answer is just like usual, all right? You still have a distributive property, they're commutative, you just foil it out. So here we have 2 times 7 minus 4i plus 3i times 7 minus 4i. So that's the distributive property. So what I'm currently doing is just foiling it out basically, okay? So let me finish that. We've got 14 minus 8i plus 21i minus 12i squared. All right? Now we'd like, I'd like to simplify this, okay? So how about that minus 12i squared? That one we can simplify, right? What is i squared? Negative one, right? So this term right here is really minus 12 times minus one, right? So this term is in fact just plus 12 in disguise. So I can combine that with the 14. 14 plus 12 is what? Um, 14 plus 12 I think is 26. So I've got 26. And then I need to take, what's 21 minus eight? 21 minus eight is, uh, oh, 13, right? Yeah. So plus 13i, and there you go. So multiplying complex numbers doesn't, you know, it's, it's the same as real numbers. It's just you have to keep in mind that i squared is minus one, right? And then you want to group like terms, like you put together the real part and you put together the imaginary part. What do I mean by that? Well, this 26 here is the real part. And 13 is the imaginary part. All right. There's so much more to say about complex multiplication. Listen, like. Not for this course so much, but if you go on in math, there's all kinds of really interesting aspects to this. Um, for example, if you could calculate the length of this number and the length of that number, then what's the length of the product? Well, the product of the two ne complex numbers, the length of that is actually the product of the lengths of this and this. So it, it works like that. When you multiply two numbers, you're getting a new number whose length is the product of the lengths of the numbers you're multiplying. And also, if you cal calculate its, its direction, like its standard angle, if you remember trigonometry from high school maybe, um, and if you don't, that's fine. But if you could calculate the standard angle of this and that, then the standard angle of the product is the sum of the standard angles. So one of the applications of complex numbers is, is just to describe rotations in the plane, right? It can describe two-dimensional coordinate geometry very elegantly. Um, another application of complex numbers, if you're like in electrical engineering, they look at AC circuits, circuits with a variable voltage, right? And in there, um, you think about resistance in a complex sense, it's called impedance. So impedance is the resistance from regular resistance, but also inductors and capacitors. And so we need a complex number to describe that, that what's called impedance. And so anyway, it's another um, well-known application of complex numbers, but there are many. All right, so uh, let's see here, example 10. Now, the example 10 and 11 are actually what we almost, so example 10 and 11 is actually how we're going to use complex numbers in this course, pretty much. It's just this, all right? So um, if you're like a little bit uncomfortable with these, like don't feel bad. Um, if you understand what I'm about to do, this is the main thing. So here we go. Square root of minus, let's say, um, oh, I don't know, 25. All right, I want to simplify that in terms of the i notation. So the way this works is this is the square root of minus one times the square root of 25. But what is the square root of i? I mean, square root of minus one is just what? It's, it's what we call i, right? And square root of 25 is what? Square root of 25 is five, right? So the square root of minus 25 
we could just write as 5i. And that's it. Now, this number is called pure imaginary because it's just got the imaginary part. Pure imaginary number. All right. Let's look, let's look at another one here. Example 11. What if I had the square root of minus, um, I don't know, 137? So again, what you do is think about it as that's the square root of minus 1 times the square root of 137, which is just what? That's equal to i times the square root of 137. So that is the main way we're going to use complex numbers. It's in order to allow for the square root of a negative number, right? The square root of a negative number is defined. It's just a pure imaginary number. That's all, right? Now, is that allowed? If we're only allowing real numbers, then no, it's not allowed, right? This is forbidden. But um, if we are allowing complex solutions to equations we're looking at, then we need to be aware of this, this number system, okay? That's, that's pretty much it for us. There's, there's much, much more to say about complex numbers, but we'll stop there. So that brings us to quadratic equations. All right, so what is a quadratic equation? How do we solve it, right? That's what we're gonna be talking about now. Uh, let me just give you the blank sort of template for it. It's something like ax squared plus bx plus c equals to zero, where a, b, and c are real numbers, and a is not equal to zero. This is a generic quadratic equation in what's called standard form. And I'll describe how to solve that in general, okay? But before I do that, let me look, let's look at a couple of easy examples relatively easy examples, okay? Um, because sometimes quadratic equations come to you in, in, in like a simpler format than this, all right? So uh, example 12, or we can put them into a simple format rather easily, right? So like suppose I have x squared, um, let's say x squared minus 3x plus 2 equals to 0. You want to solve that one. So what, how could we solve this? How about this? We, we know how to factor, right? So we could factor this. This is uh, x minus 1 times x minus 2 equal to 0. And let's think about this. How, how can we have the product of two things equal to 0? Like, yeah? Oh, that was, that was, that was a, that was not a question. Um, okay, so how about this? In order to have a product of two numbers equal to zero, it must be that either that's zero or that's zero, right? So either we have x minus one equals to zero or x minus two equal to zero, right? Or getting to the point, either you have x equals to one or you have x equals to two. So with a quadratic equation, apparently, we can have two solutions, right? Our linear equations had one solution for the most part. So factoring is one way we can solve a quadratic equation, right? This is solution by factoring. We look at another one here, okay? And I'm gonna set us up kind of in a nice way, all right? I'm gonna set us up so that the equation looks like this, um, x plus uh, let's say 7, quantity squared, equals to, oh, I don't know, um, 31. Now, this is also a quadratic equation. It's not written in standard form, right? But it's really nice in the sense that it's a square equal to something. Because if you have a square equal to something, then we can use what's called the square root property, all right? 
And the square root property says if you want to solve an equation like this, you can take the square root of both sides, right? And um, so square root property. It gives us this. It gives us x plus 7 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 31. And so what's the solution here? The solution here is x equals to minus 7 plus or minus the square root of 31. So that's not too bad, right? That's even easier than factoring, isn't it? If you have your quadratic equation written as a square, it's pretty easy to solve, isn't it? Like if it's just squared equal to something. Of course, you could have another case in this. You could have something like, I don't know, x squared equals to minus 7, right? Then the square root property in this case, what does it do? You get x equal to plus or minus the square root of minus 7, right? Which we just learned is what? We can pull the minus out to give us an i, and this gives us x equals to plus or minus i root 7. So with complex numbers, even if the square is set something equal to something negative, we can still solve it. We just get a pure imaginary solution in this case. All right. So, I mean, this is convenient. Example 12 is convenient. Example 13 and 14 are even more convenient. I seem to have lost the one. There we go. Um, they're even more convenient, right? But is every quadratic equation come nicely, neatly packaged as a square equal to something? Not really, right? So how, how, how do we... How do we solve them then? What's that? The quadratic formula? Well, we will derive that. Um, but I would, I would generally discourage, I, mean, I do want you to know about the quadratic formula, all right? But I also want you to know um, the technique which derives it because it's actually usually better to use this technique I'm about to show you than to actually just use that formula. I reserve the quadratic formula personally for like ugly numerical problems. Um, now, there are problems in your homework which just ask you to use the quadratic formula. So, you know, you can follow the instructions there. Let me um, show you the technique before I drive the quadratic formula. So the technique is called completing the square. So let me do it on an example here, example 15. Suppose we're faced with, you know, x squared, um, let's say plus 6x, um, let's say minus 6x rather, like minus 21, all right, equal to 0. Now first of all, like, um, Solving, like factoring is not going to work for this one. Factors of 21 are like 3 and 7 or 1 and 21, right? Neither of those give you like a 6 from the sum or difference. So just plain old integer factoring is going to, it's not going to work here. So we should use something else. So here's what we do. You take half of the coefficient of the x, all right? Which in that case is what? Coefficient here is 6, half of, or minus 6 rather. So I take this and I rewrite it as x minus 3 quantity squared. And then I subtract 9. These first two terms I've just written, right, are equal to this right here. I started talking about this last week as quote unquote the algorithm, right? Let me do more over here, though. Of course, the 21 is still there, so we still have minus 21. So this step that I just made is called completing the square. 
in your homework, it asks you to solve these problems by completing the square. It's talking about this. You're, or like, you might be like, well, how does that, how does that uh, exactly help us solve it, right? I mean, so this right here, there's two different paths we could go down, right? We could go the factoring path, or we could go, go the square root property path. I'll show you both, all right? First of all, let me show you the square root property path. So we could take this, right? And we can rewrite this as x minus 3 quantity squared equals to, what, 30? See, because I've got minus 9 minus 21, which is 30. Minus can you get the minus 9 again? Because if I put x minus 3 squared here, right? Oh, okay. yeah. I mean, let, let me, that's a good question. We're going to keep doing this, but let me stop and explain. So x minus 3 squared is literally x minus 3 times x minus 3, right? Yeah. Okay. So that is x squared minus 6x plus 9. Mm -hmm. Therefore, x squared minus 6x is equal to x minus 3 quantity squared minus 9. So I don't think you should need to write all this out every time you do this. There's just, there's an algorithm here, which is this. You take half of the coefficient of the x and you either add or subtract it as appropriate to x. You square that, all right? By doing that, you're going to recreate the x squared and this term up here, right? But you've also done something else. You've added the 9. So to be fair, you subtract the 9, thus not changing this to that. They're the same. They're equal. They're identical. Yeah? So it will always be subtracted or adding the square of this, Yeah, it will always be subtracted, yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll work. I'll work it in. I will work it in general in just a second. But yeah, yeah. So arithmetic. So then we get x minus three squared is equal to thirty. Then what's the solution? Well, if we've got a square equal to a number, we know how to solve it, right? It's the square root property. This gives us x minus three equal to plus or minus the square root of thirty, which gives me the solution of three plus or minus the square root of thirty. So this path we just went down, I would call solve it solution by completing the square and the square root property. There's another path we could go down though, which is to solve by completing the square and factoring. How would that look? Completing the square and factoring, I will draw an arrow this way. Well, we have x minus 3 squared minus 30, right? How do you rewrite 30 as a square? You just use your imagination, right? That is the square root of 30 squared. Why would I do that? I would do that because now I have the difference of squares. So I can fall back on my difference of squares formula we talked about first class, right? A plus B, A minus B. It's that pattern. So once I see that, I can easily factor. X minus 3 plus the square root of 30. X minus 3 minus the square root of 30 equals to 0. I have the product of two factors is equal to 0. That means either one or the other has to be 0, right? So this tells me that x is equal to 3 minus root 30 or x is equal to 3 plus root 30, which of course is exactly what? The same answer as we had up here, just written in two parts rather than the plus minus notation. If you've been wondering why we put plus minus, this path answers that question, right? Because if you go through the factoring, you get one with a plus and one with a minus. Those are the two solutions. So really this, in some sense, this derives that, if you're wondering why that's true.
Now, which is, the, which is the better path for you? You complete the square with square root property, you complete the square with, with factoring. It's kind of up to you, right, on a given problem. If it just says complete the square, as long as you do, as long as you complete the square and show your work, if you go this path or that path, I would count it correct. Now, I may have another problem where I ask you to factor the problem, factor the polynomial using completing the square, right? In that case, you need to kind of go down this path, right? Factoring is what we were doing last week. What's the difference between factoring and solving? What's the answer for a factoring problem? The answer for a factoring problem is a formula, an expression, right? The answer for an equation is either a number, a pair of numbers, or a statement that there are no numbers defined, like we saw in some examples last, last week, right? Um, all right, so these are some warm-up examples. The general proof <coughs> follows exactly the same methodology. So I, I decided, so you guys have the benefit of being the last in line, right? I've already taught this lecture three times before you. And it, and it, it finally dawned on me, I should do this scary part a little bit further into the class, not at like the beginning. So <laughs> you benefit from the suffering of others is what I'm trying to tell you. Um, so AX squared, I mean, this does need to be shown to you at some point though, C equal to zero. So let's look at how to solve an arbitrary one. I want to show you that the steps I'm going through, for example, like 15, I can go through for any, any quadratic. And here's how it goes. I divide by A. I can do that because A is assumed to be non-zero, right? And that gives me X squared plus B over A times X plus C over A equals to zero over A, which is just zero. Next step. I complete the square. So that is to say I do x plus b over 2a, quantity squared. So going back to your question, does this work in general? Yeah, I have to subtract minus b squared over 2a, quantity squared, like that, yeah. And then of course I still have the plus c over a. Now I will emphasize here again, that all I'm doing is taking these first two terms and rewriting them as a square minus a number. Once I do that, then I need to be a little bit more strategic and write the last numbers past the square as a common, like make a common denominator here and pull out a minus. So the way that's going to look is b squared minus 4 AC all divided by 4, well we could write 2A squared I suppose, or 4A squared, whatever, like that. So I just made a common denominator of the last two terms, all right. We didn't have to do this in my example 15 because we didn't have fractions, right? Like we didn't really kind of see this nuance where there were no fractions. I'll try to do an example after this with fractions so you can see it happen for numbers, but then same old, same old square root of that squared, use your imagination, the square root of the square, square root squared, and now once I do that I have difference of squares, so I can use the difference of squares formula to factor like so. And this 4a squared I can rewrite as um, 2a outside the square root, yeah? This starts to look familiar perhaps, right? So what do we find? We find that x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. This 
of course, is the famous beloved quadratic formula. The way to derive it is just with completing the square. And in fact, for a problem with numbers in it, it's often faster to actually go through the steps of the derivation for your problem to solve it than it is to just use this formula. It's actually faster to complete the square than to use that formula. A lot faster. It's also faster to factor it if you can. That's always like the fastest. The easiest way to not make an arithmetic mistake. Now that we have the formula though, let's pause and sort of uh, smell the roses so to speak. What are different cases here? So if we have b squared minus 4ac greater than or equal to zero, we get real solutions, right? On the other hand, if we have b squared minus 4ac less than zero, we get complex solutions. What did we say last week? We said that if you look at a quadratic polynomial and you have b squared minus 4ac is what? Less than zero, it's a what? It's a prime polynomial, right? That corresponds to the fact that the only way you can factor it, right, is with complex numbers. So if you're only allowing real factorizations, then we say it's prime. Every quadratic can be factored over the complex numbers. How many solutions are there to the quadratic equation if you allow complex solutions? The answer is always two, right? How many solutions are there to the quadratic equation if you only allow real solutions? The answer is it depends, right? Sometimes there's two, sometimes there's none. Sometimes that, uh, the, sometimes it's like a repeated, right? Like it could be. Okay, so <clears throat> let me move along here. Any questions about this? Do you want me to use the quadratic formula to solve one? Okay, let, me, let me show you one I would use the quadratic formula for, all right? So like here's, here's one where I would, I would use the quadratic formula. If I had something like 0.13x squared minus pi x um, plus 20 equals to 0, that's the kind of problem I would use the quadratic formula for because it's got ugly numerical junk in it. You know what I mean? Like, so here A is 0 0.13, B is minus pi, right, which is approximately minus 3.14, et cetera, right? Um, I'll just say 3.14, and C, well, C is 20, all right. So to use the quadratic formula, I would have to say X is equal to, uh, minus a minus is 3.14, right? I'll write it down symbolically first. Minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Hey, um, as you're thinking about your formula sheet for quiz one, what should be on there? I would think a paragraph explaining in your own words to your own self how you complete the square, right? An example maybe of both kinds of using the completing the square to solve problems, like maybe this example just as a, as a toy example for you, you know? Uh, certainly the quadratic formula deserves a spot on that sheet, right? Um, okay, so here, it's kind of ugly, but here it is, 3.14 plus or minus the square root of 3.14. The minus gets eaten up in the square, right? And then minus 4ac, so minus 4 times 0 0.13 times c, which was 20 divided by 2 times 0 0.13, all right? Hey, come on. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> All right, 
So that ends up giving you something along the lines of yowzers and 12, approximately 12.08 12 um, plus 2 point plus or minus 2.8 OI. So the so you take 3.1. Oh, come on, let me out of here. Let me out of here. Let me out. If you have one of those Casios, if you go into the equation mode, number three is actually a quadratic solver. You can just put A, B, and C in, and it gives you the two answers. If you have a TI uh, 30, I can't help you as much in that sense. It doesn't really matter though. You need to learn. I mean, you still have to show your work, right? So like I can tell you a shortcut to find numbers to find the answer, right? But you still need to show your work, so it doesn't really help you that much. Uh, so 12.0, so with mine it's like 12.076, but if we round up we get 12.08. You're just taking 3.14 divided by that. So would I want to complete the square on this? I, I would not, right? Because like just, it's just arithmet arithmetically just ugly. All right? Yep. Just a clarification, so on mm. Yeah. So, for, if I were to square on the one problem with the same coefficient, I would divide by, by A first before I'm. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. You just divide by it and kind of go from there. Okay. Um, here, like, you guys make up any number you like, any problem you like with whole number coefficients, we can solve it. It's just a matter of, um, like, if we had, so I don't know, 3x squared plus 4x. Um, minus 1 equal to 0, right? I should work a problem with fractions. These do happen sometimes. So I'll solve by completing the square. So my first move is to divide by 3. So I divide by 3, right? Now I complete the square, which is to take half. What's half of 4 thirds, guys? No, no, half of four thirds. Two, two thirds, right? Two thirds. And then to be fair, I have to subtract two thirds squared. I like the square root property. I think that's a better way for you guys than factoring for most problems. So let's do the square root property idea. Move all the stuff to the, you know, isolate the square. Isolate the square. So we have x plus 2 thirds squared equals to what? Equals to 4 ninths plus 1 third. What is that equal to? How many ninths is 1 third? It is 3 ninths, right? So 4 ninths plus 3 ninths is 7 ninths. We get 7 ninths. If you don't see it, use your calculator, all right? And then we use square root property. Square root property says to me that x plus 2 thirds is equal to plus or minus the square root of 7 over 9. Can you simplify that? Well, plus or minus square root of 7 over 9 is plus or minus square root of 7 divided by the square root of 9, right? So we can simplify this to plus or minus the square root of 7 all divided by 3. Right, because the square root of 9 is 3. And then solve for x. Right, so x is equal to minus 2 thirds um, plus or minus the square root of 7 over 3. Now I'd say this, this problem's on the bubble. Like, is it easier to use the quadratic formula for this one? Eh, maybe. Maybe. But if I say, if the instructions are solve this problem by completing the square, and you just use the quadratic formula, then you've not really followed the instructions. I have to take off something. I might not take off all the credit, but I'm going to take off some, yeah? So please do learn completing the square. Don't be like me. Don't ignore completing the square in your entire college algebra experience. Like, when I was a student, I just ignored completing the square. I was like, I'm going to learn it. I don't like it. I'm just going to use quadratic formula. <laughs> and I did. In this course, 
and then in calculus one, in calculus two, in calculus three. It was differential equations before I learned completing the square. I'm that obstinate. When I finally learned it, I was like, oh, I'm a dummy. I've been ignoring the easier way to do things all this time. So don't be me. Learn it now. You're like, I'm not taking through differential equations. Well, well fine, but still learn it. Right? Some of you, this is the last math, right? What's the next thing on, the, on your agenda? Maybe physics 201, right? Or something like that. Some of you are in here for that reason. Okay, so. Any questions? Let's see if I can find another problem for us to work here. Yeah, this one's a little bit different. Let me kind of give you fair warning about, we'll, we'll use the quadratic formula for this one because it told, tells us to. Um, so here it's got uh, x minus 2 times x, and this, this allows me to talk about a, a, a trap. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes if you're sufficiently sleepy, you might be tempted to try to solve this by going, oh, so the product of x minus 2 and x minus 10 is minus 16. That must mean that 1 is 4 and 1 is minus 4, right? Uh, not necessarily. This thing when you have something factored, when it's set equal to 0, that is different. 0 is special. The only way you can have the product of two numbers multiplied to get 0 is if one or the other of the numbers is 0. We have no such property for minus 16. So what we have to do here, and the book asks, the homework asks us to take a problem like this and solve it with the quadratic formula, okay? So let's do that. So we have to put it into what's called standard form, right? The standard form is ax squared plus bx plus c. It's not that yet, so we multiply it out, foil it out, and you got yourself x squared minus 12x plus 20, um, equals to minus 16, so one more step, x squared minus 12x plus 36 equals to zero. I really don't want to use the quadratic formula to solve this one. <laughs> it pains me to do it. <laughs> no, I refuse. <laughs> I don't care what the homework said. I will not do it. This is x minus six. This is x minus six squared, come on. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's all good. Um, I mean, I, I, fine, I'll use the quadratic formula. You want to see it? It hurts me, though. Uh, 12 plus or minus the square root of 12 squared, which is 144, minus 4 times a, which is 1, times c, which is 36, all divided by 2 times 1. Right? What is 4 times 36? It's 144. So inside the square root, 0. Answer, 12, plus or minus 0, divided by 2, also known as 6. Or, so you could, yeah, you can use the quadratic formula, fine. Not wrong, unless you make an arithmetic mistake, right? Or you could just factor it and see immediately that the solution is x equals to 6, right? Maybe that's kind of the point of this book exercise, is to maybe that what they're fishing for is for you to see maybe that the quadratic formula is not the best tool here. That's what I would take away from this homework problem is I shouldn't have used the quadratic formula because it made a very simple problem seemingly complicated. And again, I'm not, I'm not universally decrying the quadratic formula. I think it wouldn't have been a bad thing to do here. Let's look at it here. What would the quadratic formula look like here? The original one, we have what? A equals 3, B equals 4, C equals minus 1, right? So we'd have uh, minus 4 plus or minus the square root of 16 minus 4 times 3 times minus 1 
divided by 3 times 2, which is 6. So you get minus 4 plus or minus the square root of what? Um, 16 plus uh, 12, which is 28, yeah? Below this point, my handwriting starts to, to deteriorate. So square root of 28, maybe this is worth talking about. This is the square root of 4 times 7, right? So we could rewrite that as the square root of 4 times the square root of 7, which is 2 root 7. So this is minus, uh, you know, this, is, this simplifies to minus 2 plus or minus the square root of 7 divided by 3, which is, of course, our answer. Now you might wonder, are you going to take off points if you don't like simplify square root of 28 to like 2 times root 7? Not usually. That's not how I operate in this course. Like if you have square root of 28 as your answer for a problem and you don't rewrite it as 2 root 7, I don't really much care for the most part. Your book cares sometimes for the homework, so I can't say it doesn't matter altogether, you know, because it does for your homework, but, um, you know, if you have the right idea and you just don't take a number out of a square root or something, or you, or you leave your answer as 4 sixths instead of 2 thirds on some other problem, do I care? No, not that much. I mean, it, it does hurt me sometimes. If you leave your answer, this, this does bother me. I, I, I should not, I should admit, this will bother me. If you leave your answer as x is equal to like 3 over 3, if you, if you do this and you leave an answer like that, that does bother me. <laughs> Like, I'm just like, no, no, you must just, it's just, just, it's one, right? It's three over three, it's one, it's, we can do this, right? But four sixths, eh, life is too short to worry about that. Um, I mean, I'm happier. It is true, I am happy if you simplify to two thirds, but. All right, <clears throat> enough about that. Let us talk about quadratic word problems. <clears throat> don't we don't you go I'm blocking you yeah you're blocked ah They're probably trying to sell me an extended warranty on my car <laughs> or a timeshare. I don't know. We, we had a free timeshare for our honeymoon. And ever since then, like every so often, timeshares. That was the hidden cost for it being free. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so here's one. Am I on example? Oh, man, I need to get glass. Example 19. So this one's kind of an odd man out in terms of the homework. It says find two consecutive. I can't spell consecutive. How do I got a Q in there? Consecutive integers whose product is 56. Oh, that's just dumb. I mean, I, I, you guys tell me the answer. Seven and eight, yeah, sorry. Fine, let me make it harder. All right, so let's solve it with algebra, yeah? So we let one of the integers be, let's say, x, right? What's, th what's the next integer? If they're, if they're consecutive, you go what, x and then an x plus, x plus 